Hope you have found ASCII's virtual conference of great value to your endeavors and interests. This last panel is titled Contemporary Crisis in Cuba and Venezuela. There will be three panelists and one discussant. After the panel, we will have closing remarks, so please stay tuned. Please ask your questions online as the panel progresses. Our panelists will respond to as many of your questions as possible. You can request additional information after today. We have a joint presentation by Dr. Pedraza and Dr. Romero, which will be our first presentation. Silvia Pedraza is professor of sociology and American culture at the University of Michigan. Her work seeks to understand the causes and consequences of immigration that forms and transforms persons and nations. Dr. Pedraza has also focused on social revolution rupture with the past and attempts to create a different present. She earned a bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Michigan and holds a PhD in sociology from the University of Chicago. Professor Pedraza has been elected to numerous positions in the American Sociological Association and the Social Science History Association, having earned many awards for her distinguished career. She's former president of the Association for the Study of the Cuban Economy, and we thank her for her work with ASCII. She has authored books and numerous articles a few of her publications include Political Dissatisfaction in Cuba's Revolution and Exodus, Conceptual Models of the Immigrant Experience, and Women and Migration, the Social Consequences of Gender. She has been frequently interviewed by the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, BBC World News, the Miami Herald, among other media outlets, including radio and television. Her most recent book, Revolutions in Cuba and Venezuela, One Hope, Two Realities, with Professor Carlos Romero, will be published by the University of Florida Press. Their presentation today was inspired by their joint research and efforts. That brings us to her co-presenter, Dr. Carlos Romero, who is Professor of Political Sciences. He earned his Bachelor's in Political Science and Public Administration from the Universidad Central de Venezuela, and his Master's in Political Science from the University of Pittsburgh. His PhD in Political Science is from the Universidad Central de Venezuela as well. Dr. Romero is Professor Emeritus at the Institute of Political Studies of the Faculty of Law and Political Sciences at the Universidad Central de Venezuela, where he was director at the Center for Postgraduate Studies of the Faculty of Law and Political Sciences. He served as an advisor to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Venezuela. Romero coordinated projects for the Social Science Research Council, the Tinker Foundation, and the Frederick Ebert Foundation. Professor Romero has been awarded Fulbright, Fulbright Research Grant, a fellowship from the Social Sciences Research Council, a sabbatical year scholarship from the Kingdom of Spain, and from other very distinguished academic institutions. Professor Romero has published seven sole authored books, 18 co-authored books, and more than 150 academic articles. Dr. Romero has also been a frequent contributor to various media sources. 
And with these impressive credentials, we're fortunate to have him with us today. Dr. Romero and Pedraza will present jointly. Dr. Pedraza, please go ahead. Gracias, Beatriz. Thank you very, very much. I am going to present a PowerPoint on both Cuba and Venezuela on behalf of myself and Carlos Antonio Romero. And then uh, Romero is going to speak in Spanish and make some comments that he wants to make in Spanish. Okay. Uh, Larry, I believe that you're uploading the PowerPoint for me. Larry. Larry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, let me do that right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we always get a little bit tripped up by the technological stuff, but considering where we were last spring, where we knew nothing about nothing, we've come a long way. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. Let me get the... Yeah, because I thought I sent it to you because you... Yeah, you did. You did. And I have it. And... Let me get it for you here. And it should be coming up. And then let me screen share. Uh, uh, can you see it? Yes, I can. All right. Yeah. Okay. Just so let I me know when you want me to switch uh, slides. I can't do it by myself here. Nope. Oh, okay. Okay. Just well, say next slide. Oh I'll my gosh. <laughs> okay. So Larry is my uh, mayordomo at this time. So here's our <laughs> PowerPoint on Cuba and Venezuela contemporary crises in the plural. Okay, Larry. Thank you. Next slide. Okay. So what I'm going to do is go through these main sources of the deep crisis in Cuba little by little. And then I have a similar slide called Venezuela, Deep Crisis Main Sources, and you will see that they resemble one another a great deal. Okay, so the first thing is a dismal economy, then an old population, then an old revolution, so that there is a crisis of legitimacy, a continuing exodus, especially from the young people, growing inequality of both social class and race, the alliance with Venezuela and the relationship with the United States. Okay, Larry, next. Okay, the phrase a dismal economy is a wonderful one that comes from the work of Carmelo Mesalago. And in one word, he managed to describe uh, the situation with the Cuban economy. As we know from 1989 to roughly 1999, Cuba underwent what Fidel Castro once called the special period in a time of peace. Uh, with his ability for oratory, and the name has stuck. And so all academics talk about it as the special period. And the special period was, of course, due to the collapse of the Soviet Union and the Eastern European communism. And it meant that within just a few years, GDP contracted by 35%. And this resulted in constant hunger in Cuba. I put the word hambruna because it, there, there never was a moment when people were not hungry uh, and, and substantial health problems. I happened to have traveled to Cuba in 1991 to the Conference of the Caribbean Studies Association. And when I found my family who uh, have always been middle-class family, all the men have been doctors and all the women have been teachers. They had their eyeballs were protruding. You could see the bones beginning to stick out of their faces. They were in the early stages of famine. It was very frightening. Okay. Uh, and one of the many ways in which it manifested itself was in what came to be known as the crisis of the balseros, of the rafters, massive departure of people from Cuba, about 36,000 people who ended up in uh, Guantanamo in the summer of 1994. The next slide are my photos for the special period. And this is things that I have seen with my own eyes. You know, people quite literally pushing cars up and also pushing them down because, because they're missing spare parts. They can't get them started any other way. And so this, is a very, this was a very common sight in Cuba for many years and particularly during the special period. 
And the other is a photo that I took in a state owned bodega in Santa Clara. These are the advertisements for what they're selling. They're selling salt, they're selling rice and so on and so forth. I mean, presumably they're selling, but sometimes you have the advertisement and there is in fact no salt, no, you know, uh, no rice. Uh, the rice tends to be of very poor quality. My family complains a lot about it. And uh, sometimes last time I was in Cuba two years ago due to the COVID has not allowed me to go more recently. Uh, and I was with one of my cousins, uh, some of their friends, her friends came and visited and they brought a little gift of salt. So that this is how scarce things are in Cuba that people give each other a little gift of salt. Okay. So Larry, thank you for the next slide. Okay, this situation of the special period prompted Raul Castro's market-oriented reforms. As a reformer, which he has been, he increased tourism, self-employment, usually called cuenta propismo, and joint ventures with foreigners, particularly you know, hotels and other sort of tourist enterprises. However, you know, as uh, both Carmelo Mesalago and Jorge Perez Lopez like to point out, the reforms were too timid, they didn't go far enough, and they're still very much within the very inefficient model of centralized planning, state enterprises, and control of agriculture, with too many restrictions for the small private sector of the economy to be able to grow. So that in Cuba, if you have a small cuenta propismo, you know, like a little restaurant or something, you are taxed very heavily. There are real disincentives, and a lot of those things that spur, you know, like mushrooms, they come out of the ground, but they don't live very long because of the unfriendly uh, tax uh, structure and other disincentives. Okay. And even the sugar industry, which was once upon a time what Cuba's role in the world market was, not even thinking about the 1960s or the early part of the 20th century, considering 1989, the first year of the special period, sugar industry output is 82% below according to Carmelo Mesalago. I recall that in the 19th century, people used to say in Cuba, sin azúcar no hay país. Without sugar, there is no country. But now the fact is that there is no sugar. Okay, Larry, the next slide. Okay, these are very recent economic trends. Again, just the very last you know, uh, two decades. And you can see that the GDP growth that was 12.1% in 2006, we're not even going back to 1989 here, declined to 1.4%, 1.8%. And it is now roughly, it is minus something, okay? Uh, CEPAL estimates say minus 8%. Pedro Monreal says, I believe minus 4%. What everybody agrees on is that GDP has contracted to you know, minus something or other. In fact, Cuban economists in the islands say minus 11%. So this is a, a halfway estimate. Okay, next slide. So there's now a total reliance on tourism. And this is uh, a little puzzling to me that we come out of a country that had a monoculture of sugar and we knew that the disadvantages of ha having a monoculture of anything, whether it's sugar or for that matter, in the case of Venezuela, it was oil, uh, is that you're not diversified enough to be able to meet crises. Larry, I uh, have lost my PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, all right. That's strange. Let yeah, me I don't bring know it why. back up. <clears throat> Apologies. Okay, so back. Is, I sh no, here, the, we're here, we're fine, okay. So okay. again, we now have a monocultivo, but now the monocultivo is tourism. And you can imagine what has happened recently between Trump's sanctions and the COVID-19, you know, and, and again, we have nothing else. Uh, so now we have a new series of reforms uh, called the La Tarea del Ordenamiento. And I was pointing out to some of you guys earlier today that in Cuba, the running joke at this point about the ordenamiento is that they say about the government, tu ordenas y yo miento. You know? <laughs> so you, you give your orders and we lie. You know? uh, that involves currency reform. I leave this in the hands of my uh, better um, educated economist friends at ASCII. 
the meaning of the disappearance of the COC, but everybody seems to agree that in the short term, it's a very tough medicine to swallow, okay? La Libreta has continued and continued to decline. There's very, very little in it, okay? Many years ago, when I first started going back to Cuba, people really mostly did feed themselves from the Libreta, and then they tried to supplement that by finding a chicken or more eggs or something like that somewhere else. But now really La Libreta just gives you a few items. And like I said before, and you saw the bodega that I showed you, sometimes in fact, there is nothing on the, on the shelves, okay? Something that has definitely improved in Cuba though is the widespread use of the internet, okay? Not yet things like, you know, social media, Zoom and so on, uh, but certainly email uh, is very widely uh, used right now, okay? And at the same time, some of the recent reforms allowed people to buy and to sell homes so that there is some level of uh, capitalization going on. And for my purposes, it's important that freer travel out of the country has been allowed. Uh, it's a delimited freedom because, for example, people who go and settle somewhere else, such as in Spain, where I have a lot of family, have to return to Cuba every two years. And if they don't return within two years, they lose their rights to their property in Cuba, their rights also to healthcare in Cuba and so on. So it forces them to return. If you're in Miami, that's not too bad because you know the price of flying from Miami to Havana is not very high. But if you're in Spain, it, it eats up all of your savings. However, I think a lot about the work of Victor Perez Diaz who talked about what the Spanish emigres had learned when they left Spain to work in Germany, in France, uh, mostly Germany. Uh, and he called it un aprendizaje democrático because people really learned to see other ways of doing things. They came back with newer airs, with newer vistas and so on. So I see this as, as a positive uh, thing that has happened in recent years. Okay, Larry. Come in. <laughs> I don't like this mayordomo of mine. <laughs> okay, the fact is that Cuba has now the oldest population in the Western hemisphere. And this is a result of the very, very low birth rate. It was already low before the revolution and it became even lower during the years of the revolution. Uh, some of my family tell me that when one of my cousins were born, they hesitated a lot and they had to think a lot about how much they wanted to have that child because you know, the situation at the time was so dire. Uh, and then they were glad that they went ahead and had that child. But the fact is that as she was growing up, she had almost no little friends around her because so few people had had so few children. And now the result of that is that it has a very old population. And so the smaller working age population has to support both the young and the old, and it is a very small population. In Cuba, the pensions for the elderly and elderly are people who are over 55. Okay, they are now pushing the retirement age up. Um, but the pensions are extremely low so that in fact, people cannot live alone in, on the pensions that they receive. They are forced to live with, with their families. Okay, next slide. And it's also a fact that the revolution is very old. Okay, it's now 62 years old, uh, 63 just now, uh, beginning in January. And that means that there is in fact a crisis of legitimacy that has been taking place, okay? Although they try to hide it and to pretend that it is the same revolution that it was once, but it is not. The fact is that when Fidel Castro grew old and then he died, he left power in 2006, died in 2016, with him went that sort of messianic leadership, that populist leadership that he had been able to incarnate. Uh, Raul, who followed him, has never been messianic. No one ever, no one ever said so. Uh, he was not a charismatic leader, but he has had the, the appreciation, how shall I say, of being a reformer, okay? Uh, so the more serious crisis of legitimacy is the one that is taking place now, because of course, Raul chose Miguel Diaz-Canel uh, as his successor, and it, it, he is the first president of Cuba to have been born after the revolution triumphed. And in his inauguration speech, I still remember that he said that 
he was going to stress a continuance with the past and that all the major decisions would still be made by Raul Castro. Okay, so it's not that I'm saying that he is a puppet, it's that he said that he was a puppet. Okay, but at the same time, you know, there have been increasing challenges to the state, such as Las Damas de Blanco, Umpaco, and along with that, increased repression also. Okay, next slide. This is just so you can see Raul Castro and Miguel Diaz Canel as leadership becomes transformed uh, and its uh, limits. Next slide. Now, there have been recently increasing demands from the people to the government for real democratization, okay? And probably nothing shows this as much as the San Isidro movement, November 27th, 2020, where something like 400 mostly artists and intellectuals, mostly young people, literally sat in front of the Ministry of Culture and demanded a real dialogue, demanded freedom of association, freedom of expression, real political representation and real participation. Okay, we have to see where this goes. One should not get one's hopes up very high because they have already been called mercenaries as one would expect. Uh, but the fact is that it is the first time, it is an unprecedented social protest because of its size and because of the commitment of the people uh, who are part of it. Okay, so Larry, please, next slide. Here's the San Isidro social movement in front of the Ministerio de Cultura. Next slide. So Cuban society after 62 years is marked by what I call very different political generations. Okay, and just to contrast the oldest and the youngest, I call the youngest generation, the generation of disbelief, or maybe it should be unbelief. I've never been sure which of the two words would be better. Because, but what I am sure of is that these are very young people to whom the glorious revolution is only a story that they have been told over and over again at home, in school, in television, in movies. But what they have really known is poverty and want. And what they want most of the time is to be free and to leave. Next slide. And that is a very different generation than what I call the generation of the glorious revolution that are the people that are still in power, but are very old. I have become a firm believer in demographic change. <laughs> uh, and uh, I have family who became a part of this generation of the glorious revolution, who made the revolution, who still cling to the best of the revolution, who still point out to me all the time about the spread of literacy and public health across the island for everyone. And they have become so incredibly poor but they blame the US embargo for everything that is wrong. They never blame the Cuban leadership. Next slide. The conditions in Cuba have been so bad for so long and there is this huge diaspora community of family. And so the exodus has continued uh, and probably it's more diverse now than it ever was in the past because now it comes not only to the United States, but to all of South and Central America, to Spain, to Canada, to many European countries. But overwhelmingly, it is the exodus of people who are young. Um, very often, however, it does involve uh, people who leave temporarily and others who return temporarily and go back out again. So different than the first couple of waves of the Cuban exodus back in the early 60s, these are not people who have made a total break with the fast in Cuba, in large part because they still have family in the island at this point in time. Uh, but the, you know, it, they do have a more circular sort of pattern of migration. It's not a total break with the fast. Okay, next slide. Growing inequality. It is the case that inequality has been rising since the beginning of the special period and continues to rise in Cuba. And it becomes increasingly visible, okay, that there are huge differences in social class and huge differences in race. Um, in the block in which my family lives, for example, in Miramar, Septima Avenida, which was always a nice, very nice middle class, solid block, you can see houses that are very nicely painted and houses that are um, you know, have very lawns that are very nicely taken care of, beautiful flowers and so on. And right next to that one is another one that is in a shambles and you know, is 
practically falling apart. And so when you start asking who are the people who live in those places, the ones that live in nice homes are the ones that in one way or another are uh, connected to the party. Okay. We also know that for many years now from the work of people like Sarah Blue uh, and most recently the work of Katrin Hansing and Bert Hoffman that remittances from people who are in exile go back to their families and those tend to be white Cubans, not black Cubans. At the same time, we also know that hotels uh, for tourism prefer to hire white Cubans and that students in the universities are now becoming once again disproportionately white. So there is a lot of inequality that is rising in Cuba and a decline in the quality of social services such as in education and in public health in part due to the export of doctors and health personnel especially to Venezuela. Okay next slide. And then the alliance with Venezuela has been formidable. It has been a formidable form of mutual support that was crafted by Hugo Chavez and Fidel Castro, uh, both of which were incredibly able political leaders. And it affected, it involves trading doctors and other health personnel for oil, okay, to support Chavez program called Barrio Adentro uh, at its peak, uh, which the highest, 50,000 Cuban health workers were in Venezuela. Now it has declined to 20,000 or so. Uh, some of my Venezuelan friends told me when they were there around the time of the peak that they felt that it was like an invasion. You know, It wasn't just a solidary program of health as it was depicted, but that it was an enormous intrusion into Venezuelan society. However, at this time, Venezuela is caught in the spiral of its own economic and political crisis and its assistance is declining and it cannot be counted upon. Next slide, please. Okay, here you see a photo, which I'm very proud that I took this photo, okay? I was standing there with my very good friend, Father Mario Delgado, when this Venezuelan ship entered Havana and as it passed, as Father Mario pointed out to me, look at the Christ of Havana, it just passed by the Christ of Havana. Okay. And I'm pretty sure that we didn't say anything, but we both said a little prayer. <laughs> okay, next slide. Here's oil shipments from Venezuela to Cuba. They have been declining, as one would expect. You know, that's less than half what they were in the early 2000s. And so that decline is a permanent decline. Next slide. And last but not least, US-Cuba relations. As we know, many of us were very happy to see the restoration of diplomatic relations under Obama uh, between Ju December 2014 and July 2015. I know that I was deeply moved when I saw that the uh, American flag that had been folded by very young Marines 52, 54 years before was suddenly flown again free in front of the American embassy in Havana on a very beautiful sunny day with a very bright blue sky. Uh, it, was, it was quite a wonderful moment, really. Uh, it, this led to an avalanche of tourism. The word avalanche comes from friends in Cuba who said this was an avalanche of tourism. Four to five million tourists a year, people like Paolo Spadoni know a lot more about this than I do. Um, I know that I was forever making packages and packages and packages to give to different friends to take to my family in Cuba. And I began to feel like maybe I was FedEx or something to that effect. It was, it was really something, you know. However, it was a, turned out to be brief. Uh, this was halfway through Obama's second term. And as we know, Trump came in and very soon began to undo everything that Obama had done on all kinds of fronts, not just Cuba, but also immigration, also healthcare and so on. And to uh, court the Cuban American vote in Florida by further isolating Cuba, okay? Among the many things that he did was he prohibited US companies from doing business with Gaesa firms. Uh, some of you guys may have heard the presentation, very good presentation the other day by Tamaris uh, Bahamón de Pérez, and uh, she pointed out that in effect everything in Cuba leads up to Gaesa, so that's doing away with business with everybody. Uh, next slide, Larry, please. He ended the cruises that traveled to Cuba, 
He ended the people-to-people travel that had been initiated uh, by Bill Clinton many years before. He made it incredibly difficult for people to obtain visas. That affected our last ASCII meeting uh, where we couldn't get people to get the visas that we needed for them to come and participate with us uh, in Miami. Uh, He ended most regular airline flights to Cuba, to cities other than Havana. uh, And he most recently ended Western Union remittances. Okay, so that how to send money to Cuba now to help relatives is a real problem. Okay, and particularly for those of us that are far away from the mulas that you can find in Miami. But the mullahs are also having a harder time going back because there are fewer flights than there used to be before. So they, this will have a, a felt uh, a, you know, impact on remittances. So next, up, next slide. OK, so that's the Cuban crisis. And now here's the Venezuelan crisis. And again, the main sources are a dismal economy, a revolution not consolidated, a massive exodus that has become a humanitarian crisis, growing inequality, particularly of social class, the relationship with the US, and also a crisis of political legitimacy, dual political power, okay? So in effect, the pattern follows the Cuban one. Next slide, please, Larry. Okay, the dismal economy, in the case of Venezuela, it manifests itself in hyperinflation, Uh, The hyperinflation is so hyper that I started looking for numbers and the numbers varied, but I thought, well, gosh, it doesn't matter. Once you start saying things like you have hyperinflation, 4,000%, 1 million percent, you know, it's it's unreal. It's it's just an unreal level of, of inflation. And as my economist friends tell me, inflation hurts everybody, okay? There's also now a very critical lack of food and medicines, a great deal of hunger breakdown of public services, of electricity, of water, domestic gas, crumbling communication channels, lack of transportation, and a lot of massive street protests, mostly by very young people. Next slide, Larry, please. And that has led to a massive exodus, okay? Uh, Estimated at four to five million people. And so the Organization of American States and the United Nations have both called it a humanitarian crisis. And even Michelle Bachelet became part of the United Nations uh, Council on Human Rights and has uh, called attention to the depth of the humanitarian crisis in, in Venezuela. And the human rights violations that have gone along with it. So the fact is that a lot of countries have pulled away from Venezuela and Venezuela has lost international support. Next slide, please. I know here you can see this is Venezuelans passing over to Colombia. Uh, Bienvenidos a Colombia, it says at the top. And it made me think a lot about, you know, how different it is than the Cuban exodus has always been, had the circumstance of Cuba being an island surrounded by water. So a lot of it has had to do with flights and rafts, rafters. Uh, in the case of the Colombian, uh, Venezuelan exodus to Colombia and nearby, people go on foot and they just, you know, go over a bridge. Okay. So it's a very different, but very massive thing. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. So we are in the presence of a revolution that has never been consolidated. Um, And as we know, in 2013, the Bolivarian revolution, as Hugo Chavez always referred to it, suffered two serious blows. One was Chavez's death, and it really has never recuperated from that. Because again, Nicolás Maduro inherited his revolution, but Maduro is not the same leader. He doesn't have the same ability um, or charisma that Chavez had. And the economy has gone into a very accelerated decline. Uh, Chavez always insisted that his socialism was going to be different, that it was going to be the socialism of the 21st century, because it was going to be a socialism without poverty. Okay. But what we have seen in Venezuela in many years uh, recently is uh, also the growth of an enormous power. Next slide, please. So you can see that the recent economic trends as with Cuba is a GDP growth that is negative. It's minus all the time. 
and the forecast for 2020 is minus 30 percent okay that's even three times higher than the one in cuba okay so it is i don't i don't know what word one can use i mean mesalago used dismal to describe the cuban economy and that's a great choice like dismal economy what can one call the venezuelan economy to make people realize the depth of the problem next slide please under Nicolás Maduro, then certain political tendencies became intensified that were already there, okay, so that the so society has become more, po more polarized politically than ever, and authoritarianism has also gradually increased. And in general, one can also say, and I think Jose Manuel Puente will have more to say, about this, that the opposition has not responded well, okay? Even though they have had a parliamentary majority in the National Assembly since 2015, but the fact is that they have not participated in a number of elections, including the most recent election now in December. And that also means, and that it's fragmented and it's divided and they have different ideas and they have different people coming forth. And so in fact, they have failed to present a clear alternative. Next slide, please. So the inequality means that there are different social classes that are coping with this enormous crisis in different ways, okay? And many people, four to five million have just left, okay? And they tend to be mostly working class, okay? Of course, people with access to US dollars cope the best and they can leave and come back to the country as best they can. Other people live from a vast now informal economy that is both legal and illegal. So, you know, it, it gets uh, intersects with the drug trade. And other people just live from government social programs or international charity and relief organizations. Next slide, please. So Venezuela-US relations is also part of the crisis as it is in Cuba. The, the role of the United States in general has been more tempered, okay? There is, in the Venezuelan case, there is no equivalent yet. <laughs> but I, I, the older I get, the more I think that I may live to see everything. But as of yet, there is no equ equivalent to Bay of Pigs, okay? However, under President Trump, there have been very serious sanctions. Diplomatic relations were broken. There is a reduced financial and credit capacity of PDVSA. They stopped oil shipments to the United States. They banned financial transactions so that trade has deteriorated enormously. And more than anything else, Trump has supported Venezuela's opposition. And as he put it, all options are still on the table. Next slide, please. This tells you how trade relations have deteriorated. Okay, under Chavez, the, you know, so under the socialist moving economy, they were 55 billion in 2011 under Chavez and under Maduro in 2020, it's half a billion. Okay, so it's an enormous deterioration in trade and enormous deterioration also in oil exports to the United States. Okay, again, in 2011 under Chavez, they were $44 billion that were of oil that were exported and that is a quarter of a billion in 2020. Okay, though oil production in Venezuela has, it, for a while it did dip, but it went back up again. Next one. So the last for Venezuela is that it is experiencing a crisis of political legitimacy. Okay, a crisis of dual power. Okay, dual power meaning that there are two heads of state that claim to be the legitimate head of state. Okay, Maduro as elected president and Juan Guaido as the National Assembly president. Okay, each of them considers the other as illegitimate and each of them considers the other as an usurper. Okay, so you'll see in the next slide, the reality of dual power, Juan Guaido and Nicolás Maduro. Next slide. Uh, so Guaido has had a lot of recognition internationally. He's recognized by 60 governments. Maduro is recognized by 110, but I have to say that a lot of the 110 are those tiny little countries that don't amount to much. However, Maduro is recognized by Cuba, Russia, China, Bolivia, Argentina, Turkey, Mexico, India, a lot of folks. And the major recognition of Guaido is the European Union, Canada, the United States, 
And the United States uh, has supported Guaido's government to such an extent that Citgo, the US oil company owned by PDVSA, has now passed into the hands of the opposition. So in conclusion, next slide. This is our conclusion. Are Cuba and Venezuela at a crossroads? Okay, this is what people usually say when, you know, that somebody's in a time of crisis and they say such and such is at a crossroads. Okay, can we say that Cuba and Venezuela are at a crossroads? We think not. We think that the best image for them is to say that they are in fact standing at the edge of a precipice. It's not a crossroads any longer, it is a precipice. And that leaves us Carlos and I both with a huge question and, and all of us, I think, and that is how is it possible for their governments to continue to hold onto power in the face of these deep-seated crises? Thank you. Sí. Yeah. Bien, muy buenas tardes tengan todos ustedes. Luego de la presentación de Silvia, no me queda sino añadir el contexto internacional. Recordemos que en 1959 Fidel Castro desde un primer momento tuvo la idea de lo que se llamó después el sueño de Fidel de tener una alianza con Venezuela una Venezuela que estaba saliendo de una dictadura militar y cuyos gobiernos democráticos de aquel entonces en adelante se opusieron a la pretensión de Fidel Castro y de sus seguidores de tener un pie, de poner un pie en la vida política venezolana. A través de la lucha armada, a través de intentos de golpe militar, a través de la lucha social y a través de la presencia de partidos de izquierda, unos de ellos inspirados en la propia Revolución Cubana, entre 1959 y 1970 aproximadamente, hubo una situación de enfrentamiento total entre Venezuela y Cuba en, en el caso eh, internacional por el, todo lo que significó la Guerra Fría, en el caso regional, porque Venezuela fue y sus gobiernos las banderas fundamentales para desarrollar una política exclu excluyente de Cuba en todos los organismos interamericanos, rompimiento de relaciones, expulsión de la OEA, embargo económico, etc. Desde 1970, con la muerte del Che Guevara, con algunas circunstancias vividas en las relaciones entre la Unión Soviética y Cuba, eh, en la apertura que hubo de algunos gobiernos latinoamericanos frente a ese pasado de bloque opositor total, eh, Cuba pudo establecer una serie de relaciones diplomáticas impensables en la década de los 60 y también lo, logró eh, tener una presencia en algunos experimentos de carácter socialista como fue la experiencia chilena de Salvador Allende con los militares peruanos, los militares ecuatorianos y el mismo regreso del peronismo al poder. En ese contexto también nuevas repúblicas del Caribe de una manera u otra eh, comenzaron a tener relaciones consulares y luego diplomáticas con eh, Cuba, lo que dio lugar a un espacio mucho más amplio para la Venezuela que se había opuesto en la década de los 60 para poder entonces establecer sus propias relaciones luego de la ruptura en el año de 1961. Esas re relaciones diplomáticas se iniciaron por segunda vez en diciembre de 1974 y luego entonces la relación entre Cuba y Venezuela pasó a un plano más diplomático de menos enfrentamiento político ideológico hasta 1999, pero nunca, absolutamente nunca, se pensó que iba a haber un turning point tan importante a partir de 1999. Los historiadores dicen, siempre hubo el sueño de Fidel, y yo creo que sí, siempre hubo, a pesar de las relaciones tan difíciles de los 60, a pesar de, la, de las relaciones diplomáticas de bajo valor político y sobre todo de bajo valor económico, siempre hubo 
una quinta columna de Cuba y Venezuela en el sector militar y en el sector político. Esa quinta columna dio resultados, es decir, se expresó en la década de los 60 con los intentos de golpe, pero vuelve a dar resultados y un resultado mucho mayor a partir del, intent, del intento de golpe de Hugo Chávez Frías en febrero de 1992. En ese entonces en, había un trabajo político en las Fuerzas Armadas y en partidos políticos de izquierda que veían con simpatía a Cuba, pero no veían con simpatía a Cuba solamente los partidos de izquierda y los militares adoctrinados, sino también muchos sectores sociales que manifestaron inclusive una alegría por la presencia de Fidel Castro en la toma de posesión de Carlos Andrés Pérez en 1989, me refiero a su segundo gobierno. Es decir, había una especie de una relación que yo he denominado, y perdón la palabra, coqueta entre Cuba y Venezuela, que de cierta manera eliminó un, en la, en la, a, la vista, a la vista de muchos lo que estaba pasando por debajo, que el sueño de Fidel estaba presente. Y ese sueño de Fidel se concretó con la llegada de Hugo Chávez a la presidencia de Venezuela en 1999. Por supuesto, nadie se engañó en ese momento en que iba a haber un cambio en la política exterior de Venezuela, que iba a haber una relación especial con Cuba y que Venezuela iba en un contexto diferente, porque no era la Guerra Fría, sino el mundo multipolar, a tener una relación de expresión internacional de carácter antioccidental. Cuando decíamos eso en 1999-2000, parecía un poco extraño, porque no había todavía datos para poder entender esa relación tan estrecha que comenzó a apretarse en el año 2000 con el famoso convenio y, por supuesto, como dijo Silvia, en el 2003-2004 con la asistencia de las misiones, no solamente la misión Barra Adentro, sino la misión Milagro y otras misiones que fueron desarrolladas por el gobierno de Hugo Chávez con el apoyo irrestricto de Fidel Castro. Entonces, ahí nosotros podemos detenernos y, y preguntarnos ¿Qué pesó más la relación ideológica entre Cuba y Venezuela a partir de 1999? ¿La concreción del sueño de Fidel o la combinación de elementos de carácter pragmático? Yo pienso que este último es la mejor explicación para entender esa relación en, a partir de 1999. Como decimos nosotros en Venezuela en el lenguaje coloquial, Fidel Castro la pegó, es decir, al darse cuenta que Hugo Chávez era un instrumento fundamental para sus eh, condiciones, que en ese momento, no olvidemos, eran muy difíciles, la desaparición de la Unión Soviética, etcétera, etcétera, el periodo especial y todo lo que se dio antes de 1999, y había también un know-how muy grande de Fidel Castro en relación a líderes del tercer mundo, porque desde el comienzo de la revolución, el sueño de Fidel, que está referido al caso venezolano, no significa que nos olvidemos que hubo relaciones especiales con países de, de eh, América Latina, de Asia, de África, a través de la tricontinental, de la OSPAL y de todos los movimientos de la política exterior de Cuba a nivel mundial. Acuérdense ustedes de la famosa frase de Jorge Domínguez, que Cuba es un país pequeño con una política exterior grande. Eso dio entonces como resultado la ampliación de la relación entre Venezuela y Cuba a límites imaginables, no solamente desde el punto de vista doméstico en cuanto a llevar adelante eh, la política exterior de, conjunta en Naciones Unidas, en, en, en América Latina, etcétera, sino también es muy importante destacar que desde el punto de vista internacional eh, hubo un una coincidencia entre Cuba y Venezuela en relación a sus, las políticas exteriores y sus socios. Todo esto llevó entonces a una época de oro de la relación entre más o menos 1999 y 2012, que se termina con el comienzo de la crisis económica en ambos países y con el fallecimiento de Hugo Chávez. Pero también no podemos negar que hubo una condición diferente desde el punto de vista de la oposición venezolana, porque la oposición cubana fue radicalmente excetada en pocos meses, 1959, 1960, cosa que no pasó con, y no pasa con el caso venezolano, donde 
por múltiples razones, ha habido una resistencia opositora venezolana que todavía tiene, inclusive está, por supuesto, uh, cuestionando inclusive la legalidad y la legitimidad del régimen venezolano en este momento. Entonces, pasemos a la última parte de mi comentario. En ese contexto comienza a darse, comienzan a darse tres situaciones que a mi modo de ver ligan a Cuba y Venezuela eh, a partir del año 2012. Primero, el cambio de actitud del gobierno de los Estados Unidos sobre la tolerancia. Todos nosotros conocemos lo que es la tolerancia o drawing the line en el caso específico de los Estados Unidos. Estados Unidos comenzó en el 2012 y sobre todo a partir del 13 con el gobierno de nuevo gobierno venezolano de Nicolás Maduro a, a dictar lo que eh, tomando de una película famosa yo he denominado do the right thing. Es decir, hasta ese momento había suspicious minds, había mentes sospechosas eh, y el principio de la relación, por supuesto, había lo que también agarro de una, de una, uh, de, de una, una frase, wait and see, esperar y ver. De esperar y ver se pasó a mentes sospechosas o suspicaces. Y de mentes suspicaces se pasó a do the right thing. Del año 13 en adelante hay una cuarta posición que se ha desarrollado sobre todo a, a, a partir del año 2017. Go out, less power, leave power. Es decir, es una situación ya mucho más difícil en materia de los límites. Y esos límites van acompañados también de una crisis económica muy grande, tanto en el caso cubano, y yo estoy seguro que José Manuel lo va a hablar del caso venezolano, que, fíjense ustedes, vuelve a retomar el tema del pragmatismo. Porque, repito, el tema ideológico Inclusive la oposición venezolana lo ha usado mucho, a mi modo de ver, erróneamente. Es decir, en el sentido de que los cubanos son comunistas y están detrás de los comunistas venezolanos, etc. Pero lo que me interesa destacar es la relación pragmática de, de Brothers in Arms que tiene en este momento, que tiene durante todo este tiempo Cuba, que tienen Cuba y Venezuela. Entonces ahora parece mentira que la situación los está acercando. Los está acercando porque hay, hay un límite en el caso cubano. Silvia tiene razón. Eh, correcto. Silvia tiene razón. Eh, eh, no con la misma dureza que ha tenido Venezuela por parte de los Estados Unidos y de América Latina. Pero hay una situación de límite. Pero sobre todo hay una relación entre Cuba y Venezuela. Es decir, para los Estados Unidos se trata hoy por hoy de castigar a Venezuela, pero a castigar también a Cuba por su relación con Venezuela. Eso ha llevado entonces a todo ese gran setback que hemos, que hemos visto en, en la relación entre Estados Unidos y, y Cuba, como también hemos visto en la relación entre Estados Unidos y Venezuela. Para completar, para terminar, eh, solo me queda, me, me queda decir que entrando este año 21, estoy convencido que va a haber una mayor relación entre Cuba y Venezuela, todo lo contrario de lo que algunos analistas han dicho eh, en los últimos años, eh, mientras exista, por supuesto, el régimen de Maduro, y esa relación entonces lo va a llevar a una situación de costo muy grande para el caso eh, cubano. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, uh, Silvia and Carlos. Excellent presentation. And I can see why you are collaborating on these topics. Um, I'm sure that our participants have enjoyed it and gives a lot of food for thought and for future investigation. Our next panelist is Jose Manuel Puente, who is professor at the Public Policy Center, Instituto de Estudios Superiores de Administración, and visiting professor at the University of Salamanca and the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. He earned his bachelor's in economics from the Universidad Central de Venezuela and a master's in public policy and administration from the London School of Economics. He earned a second master's in public policy from the University of Oxford or Oxford University. His PhD from Oxford is in political economy. 
In addition to his exceptional formation, Dr. Puente has consulted with numerous international institutions, including the Inter-American Development Bank, the World Bank, various legislative bodies and governments, and international corporations. He has contributed to the Harvard Business School's Global Colloquium on Participant-Centered Learning and has received numerous awards for his contribution. He has distinguished himself as a lecturer at prestigious think tanks, research institutions, and universities in various countries. His areas of academic interest are political economy, public finance and budgeting, social expenditure and Venezuelan macroeconomics and emerging markets and developing economies. His most recent book was with Barushka Quiles, The Political Economy of the VAT Reform in Venezuela. His presentation today is titled Venezuela in the State of Macroeconomic Collapse, a Historical and Comparative Analysis. Thank you very much, Jose Manuel, and uh, you're on. Many thanks, Beatrice. <clears throat> I would like to say thanks to the Association for the Study of the Cuban Economy and the organizers of the conference for the invitation, and particularly to my very good friends, uh, Silvia Pedraza for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. When you are Venezuelan and you were born in the Caribbean, in some way you are a bit of, of Cuban as well. We share many <laughs> things in common. Uh, uh, but uh, more than, better than a thousand uh, words, uh, a number. Let me show you uh, some key numbers of the Venezuelan economy to present my main ideas that some of them has been beautifully presented by uh, Carlos and Silvia. I don't have to make a, a more emphasis in many of them, but uh, just a few uh, uh, main ideas. Uh, unfortunately, the Venezuelan Central Bank haven't published data for 2019 and 20, especially about the GDP. In conclusion, my analysis is going to be based on data from 1950 to 2018. Basically, my colleague, uh, uh, Jesus Rodriguez, who works in, in UK, uh, and I, we built two databases. One database is from the Venezuelan Central Bank for the period 1950 to 2018. And the second database was uh, from the IMF for 192 countries for the period from 1980 to 2018. In the second part of my presentation, I'm going to present some data with projections and estimation of the IMF and the World Bank about Venezuela to give you the whole picture of how, how has been the performance of the Venezuelan economy for the whole period of the revolution, including 2019 and 20. For the moment, what we can see with the data, official data available, is that Venezuela uh, in the last five years had a uh, tremendous economic contraction of, of the real GDP per capita. As you can see, the GDP per capita in 2018 is the lowest in history of Venezuela after five years of economic recession. Uh, when you see the period between 2014 and 2018, Venezuela has lost 47% of the total GDP, almost half of the uh, total GDP of Venezuela disappeared as a consequence of five years of economic contraction. Uh, my colleague and I, we wanted to understand what's the meaning to, of losing 50% of GDP in the Venezuelan history and in the history of the world. And using um, uh, 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 econometric package data, we, and the data we built, we identified all the countries in the world that have suffered five consecutive years of economic contraction and aggregate that and compare that with Venezuela. Two slices to, to, share, to show you the main findings of this analysis, uh, analysis with data uh, around the world. First, 
47% is without any doubt the strongest uh, economic contraction that Venezuela suffered in the last uh, 70 years. Venezuela never before had five some consecutive years of economic contraction, but this also is the strongest econ economic contraction uh, of any Latin American economy. It's even bigger, stronger than the economic contraction that suffered Bolivia between 81 and 86, the period of hyperinflation, or even stronger than the economic contraction that suffered Nicaragua between 84 and 89. And as Silvia presented, it's even worse that the worst period of the Cuban economy durante el periodo especial en tiempo de paz. This is nothing compared with Venezuela in terms of economic contraction, almost 50% of total GDP disappear in five years. In terms of the, of the world, well, obviously you have a terrible performance in countries like Ukraine. They suffer a kind of uh, social unrest trying to create the condition for a political change. And Ukraine between 92 and 97 uh, lost almost 50% of the total GDP. Sierra Leona in Africa formerly lived a, a, a a war, a civil war, and that civil war had a very negative impact over the economy and they lost almost 50% of the total GDP. Venezuela will be for the period between 1918 and 2018, the, the third worst macroeconomic performance in the world. If you include uh, in that data, the projection of the IMF for 2019 and 2020, IMF projected that the contraction of Venezuela in 2019 was minus 35% in one year and 25% in 2020, you conclude that Venezuela lost 76 or 77% uh, of the total GDP. I mean, after seven years of economic contraction, now Venezuela has a GDP that is only 23% of the GDP that Venezuela had in 2013. That means that Venezuela has a GDP today that, that is smaller than uh, Costa Rica <clears throat> or Dominican Republic. Remember that Venezuela in the 70s and the 80s was, on one, was one, one of the richest countries in, in, in Latin America with the biggest oil reserve. And after, after seven years of economic disaster, now the GDP of Venezuela is smaller than Costa Rica and Dominican Republic. If you see the performance of Venezuela compared with the South American economies, it's obvious that Venezuela had the worst macroeconomic performance in the last 20 years, having Peru, Bolivia, Chile, and Colombia, the best performance in the world. Uh, uh, in, 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 in South America in the same period. Uh, I mean, uh, basically Venezuela is an outlier together with Cuba in terms of macroeconomic performance on the last 20 years in South America. But uh, also Venezuela not only have a terrible performance in terms of economic growth, Venezuela is at the moment the only economy in the world in hyperinflation. It's the second hyperinflation in the 21st century the first one was Zimbabwe, Venezuela was the second one. And since 1989, the Latin American country didn't have a hyperinflation. The last hyperinflation in Latin America was Peru in 2000, uh, um, in 1000, uh, I'm sorry, in 1989, 1989. Since 1989, uh, the continent didn't uh, suffer uh, 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 a and Venezuela is the first hyperinflation since 1989. The last case was Peru. And as, as uh, Silvia said, uh, the, the hyperinflation have a devastating consequence over the population. Uh, uh, you know, uh, basically, the, the so what I'm going to show you now in a, in a bit, the in social indicators of Venezuela. And now Venezuela is unfortunately the, the poorest country in the continent as a, as a consequence of four years of hyperinflation. Something that is very usual for the Cuban government and for the Venezuelan government is to try to hide their, their incompetence in, the, in, 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 the, in implementing economic policy, trying to say that all the, the bad performance of the Cuban economy and the Venezuelan economy is consequence of the economic sanctions or the decrease in the oil prices in the case of Venezuela. 
Here you can see the correlation, that there is no correlation or causality between the sanctions that Venezuela is suffering and the decrease in the oil prices with a decrease in the economy. The first year that Venezuela had economic contraction was 2014. And at that year, the oil price in average was $88 per dollar, per $88 per barrel. Uh, and we didn't have any sanctions at all until 2017 and without the existence of COVID-19. I mean, uh, the, the economic crisis of Venezuela is a homemade crisis. Venezuela chose the wrong set of economic policy, a, a, a set of economic policy that took Venezuela to the worst uh, uh, situation in terms of a macroeconomic performance. And you can summarize that set of economic policy in five lines. Exchange rate controls, interest rate controls, price controls, price in the labor market, y la guinda de la torta. Uh, the expropriation and nationalization at the best style of the Cuban revolution. But, uh, the Venezuelan government uh, not, uh, expropriated more than 300 companies in the last 21 years. That created a an, an, an business environment, many negative, and what is one of the originals of the terrible macroeconomic crisis. Conclusion, this is a homemade uh, crisis uh, consequence of the red set or the wrong set of economic policy in the last 20 years. Nothing else more than that. Obviously, the, the, the crisis or the collapse of, of, the Venezuela, of Venezuela is the collapse of the oil production. As you can see, when Hugo Chavez won the election in 1988, the production of Venezuela was around 3.2 million barrels per day. The last figure that we have from OPEC for October 2020 is 350,000 barrels per day. I mean, in 21 years, Venezuela lose uh, 80, 85% of the cap total capacity of produced oil. And the main problem for Venezuela is that the oil is 96% of the total export of Venezuela. The collapse of oil is the collapse of the Venezuelan economy. And now, the, the, the point that Carlos and Silvia presented, that symbiosis between Cuba and Venezuela and the exchange of um, uh, that alliance between doctors trade for oil or, or, or intelligence services trade for oil. The problem is that Venezuela doesn't have enough oil to survive and I don't think how long they can to continue sending oil to Cuba. And conclusion, the possibility to continue supporting the Cuban revolution for Venezuela is very limited because, because the Venezuelan economy and the oil sector has collapsed. And that's something that is a really nice topic for a paper, how, how will be the dynamic between those factors and the future of Venezuela and Cuba, and both future are interrelated given the symbiosis of both economies. For 2020 and 21, the projections are very negative. Unfortunately for Venezuela, uh, not only the 2020 was terrible, so ECLAC uh, projected the total contraction in minus 30%, IMF proje uh, projected the uh, total contraction of minus 25%, but uh, unfortunately for 2021, that the projections of all uh, institutions are very negative for Venezuela. Unfortunately, uh, According with this, there, there is high probability that the 2021 will be the eighth consecutive year of economic contraction for Venezuela. And with that, Venezuela will lose maybe 80 or 82% of the total GDP. It's uh, devastating in economic terms and devastating in social terms. In social terms, very briefly, obviously when you have that kind of uh, performance in macroeconomic terms, you have obvious consequence in the social sector. In the last 21 years, the level of poverty doubled uh, as a consequence of the very bad macroeconomic performance, but as something that's very important to emphasize. Cuba is an economy with very limited resources. Venezuela is a very rich country and the total income of Venezuela between 1999, the first year of the revolution, and 2020 was, for oil, $1 billion. 
1 billion with 12 zeros. That was the income of Venezuela during the last 20 years. And with that income, after that income, the Venezuelan revolution took the Venezuelan for, to the worst macroeconomic performance of the world and doubled the uh, uh, levels of poverty. It's, uh, it's, it's devastating what the Venezuelan revolution has done as a consequence of the mismanagement of the oil and the mismanagement of the uh, 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 all resources. The salary in Venezuela, I know that recently Cuba increased their minimum salary to around $82, $83 per, per month. Uh, uh, and, but uh, the minimum salary in Venezuela is, is, uh, is amazing. Probably Venezuela has, for sure, has the lowest minimum salary in Latin America and probably is the lowest minimum salary in the world. Today, according with the official, official exchange rate of today, minimum salary of Venezuela is $1.02 per month. That means that an important proportion of the population have to live with three cents of dollar per day. Under any, any analysis, uh, that implies that an important proportion of the population live in under poverty conditions. I remember the first time that I went to Cuba in the 1990s, and I said, what wow, poor fellows, how they can survive with 40 or $50 per day? Now a Venezuelan, the minimum salary is 40 times lower than that salary. It's something amazing. That's something that I couldn't believe 20 years ago. But as you know, the socialist revolution can make miracles in Cuba and in Venezuela. Obviously, other the, the consequence of the, of the macroeconomic crisis is the migration process. I wrote last year a paper with Magali Sanchez from Princeton and uh, a very good friend from uh, Peru, Ivan de la Vega, and we believe that the total exodus of Venezuelans in the last 21 years has been between five and six million people. That implies that probably together with Cuba is the biggest exodus in Latin American history. Basically the economic crisis, the social crisis, the humanitarian crisis is uh, sending millions of Venezuelans out of Venezuela trying to find a country where they can have an income to buy the food and medicines, the medicines they need. An inventory of the total social impacts that, that is consequence of probably the most important social uh, pool that is made in Venezuela, Encuesta and Kobe. Just a summary of that. According with that analysis made by the ENCOVI, 96% of the population in Venezuela are poor in terms of income. Venezuela is the poorest country and the second most unequal in Latin America. 30% of the children have chronic malnutrition. Uh, the population fell to 28 million as a result of migration. We should have at the moment 33 or 34 million people as a uh, number as a population. And, um, However, we have 28 million as a consequence of the migration process. 60% of the school population is able to attend classes. 40% they cannot attend classes. More than half of the poorest population don't compl compl complete secondary education. And in the last 20 years, we have lost 3.7 years of life expectancy as a consequence of the very bad economic performance and the destruction of the health public system. We know how to rebuild the economy. We, we, there are some agreements between economists. That's not the problem. I don't have the time to uh, present all the details, but the main problem that we have is the same problem that Cuba have. Before to implement in a successful way a stabilization program with an important amount of international aid we have to create a condition for a political change, for a political transition. And that's the problem. Uh, without political change, there is no any possibility of uh, economic change. And that's the drama of Venezuela. After the results of the election of the National Assembly now in December, that political transition is far away from, for, from today. And that's the problem. But in some way, in the near future, we can uh, create the condition for a political change. And we can elect a president with that all the opinion polls show that 80 or 85 percent of the population wants a political change. The problem is that uh, the opposition is divided between different leaders, leaders and different strategies. 
and, and the, the, the revolution is very small in terms of the total population of more than 10 or 15 percent of the population, but they are one block that works together. And the, the opposition have a serious problems of collective action. Without resolving those problems, it's impossible to implement in a successful way these three stages of the economic reform. The first one, a social emergency program, the first 100 days of that new government, we have to create direct subsidies for the 50 or 60% poorest part of the population to be sure that they can get the food and the medicine they need. In the second stage, we have to implement with important resources from the international community, IMF, World Bank, and the international community, and a stabilization program with policies in exchange rate policy, fiscal policy, monetary policy, to stabilize the economy and recover economic growth, recover a uh, low level of inflation, and reduce the levels of scarcity in Venezuela that's very high at the moment. And then after we stabilize the economy, we can go for the third uh, stage of that reforms, structural change programs and institutional reforms with the main idea to uh, diversify the economy because until now it's, it's not only the fault of the revolution, in the last 70 years, Venezuela has been only a, produce, a producer of oil, no more than that. And we have to diversify to, to start four or five engines of economic growth to diversify, de diversify the economy and create the wealth to redistribute to the, to the population. Uh, finally, just to finish with uh, a, a little bit of optimistic, uh, it's very difficult nowadays to be optimistic in Venezuela, but I, I still be, I believe that we have the, an incredible potential as an economy, and we shouldn't forget that. Venezuela still have the biggest oil reserve in the world. Venezuela have the 25% of the total oil reserve in the world are in Venezuela. Just still, if you could manage in the, in the right way that uh, uh, black gold, you can do many things. Venezuela still have the biggest gold reserve in Latin America. Venezuela still have the fifth biggest certified gas reserve of the world. And additionally, we have extraordinary potential in petrochemicals, tourism, tropical fruits, strategic, strategic location. When I see the beaches of Venezuela uh, and, and the beaches of Cuba, uh, what's the difference between the beaches of Cuba and Venezuela and the archipelago de Bali or San Cibar, the island of San Cibar? The difference is that uh, Baradero and the beaches in Venezuela are much nicer than that. We have much more better uh, beaches and uh, um, weather than many countries that receive a huge amount of tourists every, every year. I mean, we have the potential where we, we need the right leadership that lead the country in the right direction and, come and build the political transition to after that political transition start the process of rebuilding the Venezuelan economy. Many thanks for your attention and it has been a pleasure to talk with you at least uh, in 20 or 25 minutes about uh, the dramatic uh, situation of Venezuela, but I still have the hope that we can rebuild the country in the near future. Many thanks for everything. Thank you very much, Jose Manuel. Really appreciate all the data that you have presented, which will be very helpful for further thinking. But now it is time for Efraín Velázquez, our discussant, uh, who is going to help us reflect on the presentations by Dr. Pedraza, Romero, and Puente. He will also cite Dr. Amuchastegui who was not able to join us today. His presentation was titled Venezuela's Election, the Fragmented Opposition at State. He's a former intelligence analyst, historian, and professor of international relations. But back to our discussant, Dr. Velasquez is an economist with a degree from Northwestern University and the Andres Bello Catholic University in Caracas, Venezuela. He has been professor of economics at Andres Bello Catholic University Graduate School 
and president of Venezuela's National Economic Council. In addition, he is called upon by international lending organizations such as the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank to serve as expert consultant. Please, Efrain, um, you're on. You have to unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, thanks, Beatriz. Uh, first, uh, I would like to thank ASCII for these invitations. Uh, my comments are going to be structured in the following way. At first, political consideration of Venezuela and Cuba will be described. Then I will present uh, the current characteristics of the economic and social environment. And finally, my views regarding how the future may look like will be exposed. Initially, I have to, it have to be realized that uh, unstable political process have major impacts over the economic dynamic and social context. In many cases, economic changes and social improvements are not possible until political solutions are achieved and implemented. It seems that Venezuela may be a specific example of that consideration and Cuba may not be a different one. As described by Romero, Venezuela after, uh, after uh, Chavez's death in 2013 has experienced under the Maduro administration increasing political polarization expansionary military participation and escalating anti-democratic behavior in a context of institutional weakness. It became evident when the opposition parties won the National Assembly elections in December 2015. From that moment on, the Maduro administration started a process to reduce the role of the National Assembly. Up to December 2020, more than 100 Supreme Court decisions limited the National Assembly responsibilities. As this is known, political opposition parties got a supermajority uh, in the election of 2015. It implied that no political negotiation were required in order to reach a decision. However, on December uh, 30th, 2015, six days before the new National Assembly was installed, the Supreme Court suspended the proclamation of three new members in order to eliminate the supermajority. However, the new National Assembly accepted those three members. And three days after that, the National Assembly as a whole was condemned by the Supreme Court. Therefore, its responsibility were suspended, a budget, salary, and headquarter control were suppressed. In addition, some additional assembly, some um, national assembly members were put in jail. A 60-day state, a state of exemption and economic emergency was also decreed by the uh, Maduro administration in January 2016. Based on the 1999 constitution, this norm allows the administration to implement economic, fiscal, and exchange rate decisions without National Assembly approval. The, the, that decree was extended sweat 26 times. In that political environment, the Maduro administration organized the contingent National Assembly election in July 2017, and the opposition party did not participate. The new entity was supposed to write a new, a new constitution, but it never did it. In fact, the new entity basically approved waiver for the parliamentary immunity of the National Assembly members, appointments of, uh, to other public powers and some economic and tax laws. Its activity just ended in December 2020 because the new National Assembly was installed 
just uh, yesterday, January 5th. Despite the fact that the Constituent National Assembly mainly helped the Maduro administration to implement several political decisions against the opposition groups and local administrative issues, it was not recognized locally or internationally, even by the closest allies like China and Russia. Major agreements in the energy and financial sectors, which could have uh, been supportive to the administration in the context of US sanctions were not possible. The 2020 National Assembly election was a significant political event for the Maduro administration. A political strategy was implemented to regain the needed public power, knowing its minority situation. First, the Supreme Court named the new friendly Electoral National Council. As anticipated, fair electoral conditions were not met and opposition group did not participate. Then a non-competitive tailor-made Maduro-friendly political opposition was constructed and the number of uh, assembly members was uh, increased. Credible international observers were not involved. Even the Maduro administration rejected the European Commission proposal to postpone the election and design a fair political scenario. The National Assembly election, the recent one, outcome was uh, as expected. The Maduro political organization got 69% of the vote, but this election only had 30% of participation. The, that is the lowest participation of any electoral process in Venezuela since 1958. It was lower than the uh, 2018 presidential election and the 2017 constituent national uh, assembly election. Just to tell you, the 2015 national assembly election participation was 74%. This political outcome may represent the rejection to the uh, Maduro administration. At the same time, it exhibits the difficulty of the divided and fragmented opposition group to maintain its political presence in an unfair environment. This political organization now has to wait for a possible 2022 revocatory, uh, revocatory referendum. The National Assembly election in addition was considered illegitimate for the international community as it was the Maduro uh, 2018 presidential election. This situation clearly shows, as mentioned by Romero, the violation of a fuel electoral and institutional process in a democratic environment and the loss of separation of power. As anticipated, problems of representations will come out. On the other hand, the former National Assembly called for a public consultation, a referendum between December 5th and December 12th. The participation was relevant, and actually that uh, consultation tried to fulfill the new political environment starting this January. This political, uh, this political framework will continue to have significant economic and social consequences in Venezuela. Changes in the current trend may, do, may only be possible with a political transition. However, different views regarding political transition may be at both political groups. The former Maduro group may see political transition among themselves with full support of the military, when the latter, the opposition, may be expecting a complete political substitution. Therefore, Political transition laid by domestic actors seem unlikely, seems unlikely to me. Any political negotiation, it seems like it may, any political negotiation may need a non-domestic third party. The exercise implemented by Norway and the European Union has been unsuccessful so far. New approaches will be required. 
the Maduro administration is bringing again the possibility of, of a new political dialogue starting in 2021. In the past, those initiatives had nowhere. Opposition groups will have to find new political grounds, means, and messages in a framework with a limited civil, limited civil liberties and political rights. It, it will not be an easy task with huge risk. A vision about the Venezuelan future is indispensable to motivate young people to participate in the political process in a step of migrate to another country. Cuba is not a different situation. It's not in a different situation to today's Venezuela. The Communist Party maintained its limited power, control all economic decisions in a highly centralized context and directs all domestic politics. Cuba's economic decision based on central planning, including collective ownership of production means, centralized decision-making process, progressive redistribution, among others, has resulted in a major economic and social failure. Following Mesa Lago, Cuba, Cuba, Cuba has heavily depend on substantial aid and subsidy from Soviet Union first and now Venezuela. The Raul's economic reform did not change the economic trends. According to Pedraza, the president Miguel Diaz Canel, Raul Castro's su successor, has only promised continuity with uh, the existing economic models. And the new, econo the, the new uh, Cuban constitution approved in February 2019 does not introduce any significant change to uh, the model of central planning and state dominance of the economy. Cuba does not have separation of power and electoral institutional process as the main components of a democratic system. This political scheme has had and will continue to have significant economic and social consequences. Pol political transition is not expected soon. As Pedraza mentioned regarding young people, have no only poverty and cannot see a better future. In the case of Venezuela, the political process has generated major economic and social impacts, as just presented by, uh, by Puente. Under the Maduro administration, Venezuela annual GDP on average dropped 12% on average uh, annually between 2013 and 2020. And inflation has got to more than 2,900% per year without including the uh, 2018 hyperinflation. Open unemployment got to 24% in 2020. Central Bank International Financial Position reduced to only $6 billion in 2020 from almost $30 billion at the end of 2012. All of this happened without a national disaster or a war. Just in 2020, GDP may have fell 20% and inflation reached over 2,600%. As mentioned by Puente, those dramatic macroeconomic results of Venezuela occur when Venezuela proving all reserves may be over 300 billion barrels and represent almost 25% of the world uh, proving oil reserve according to the 2017 OPEC annual report. The current weak financial position in Venezuela was generated by the deterioration of the oil industry. Venezuela oil production plunged 83% in the last eight years. This situation was mainly caused by reduced capital expenditure, massive corruption, general mismanagement, and uh, social expenses. It is important to mention that the U.S. sanctions did not create this dynamic, but they accelerated. The 2017 sanctions eliminated the financial flows to Venezuela and PDVSA, and the 29, uh, 2019 sanctions affected Venezuela oil export and oil-related imports, and also blocked Venezuela financially. The former, the 2017 sanctions, broad external debt arrears, and the latter uh, 2019 sanction pushed oil and gasoline production down 
and forced the Maduro administration to open the currency markets. The new international environment against Venezuela pressed to major structural changes. Now fiscal policy can only generate price volatility. It means higher inflation and currency depreciation instead of economic growth as in the past, because the government financing can only occur through the central bank since there is not any fiscal space available. It has open opportunities to the private sector. However, it has to work with the poor society with reduced demand of goods and services. It has to be emphasized that those changes have happened in Venezuela, but not nobody at the Maduro administration has changed their view on economic matters. It is consistent with uh, sanguinetic comments regarding cultural issues. The current circumstances have forced them to implement those decisions in order to maintain political control. This situation implies that Venezuela will have problems to growth in the future because of the interconnection of the oil sector with the other sectors of the economy. The oil sector has close ties to several sectors. The oil-related sectors uh, may represent 40% of the total GDP. That implies that uh, the economic activity in Venezuela will not improve on a sustainable basis until oil investment recovers. It means that economic growth and social well-being directly depend on a political transition or will not happen until the political transition is in place. The social consequences of the Venezuela economic situation have been huge. Per capita GDP has dropped 66% in the last eight years because of the size of the economy reduced 69% during the same period. These calculations include migration, migrations which represent 12% of the total population in 2020. The impact of COVID-19 in Venezuela was devastating in 2020. Romero presented the Venezuela situation as in a state of pre-collapse, hyperinflation, lack of food and medicine, breakdown of public services, uh, crumbling uh, communication channels, insufficient transportation, together, uh, together with hunger, immigration, and social unrest. The situation is extreme. The situation of Venezuela has led to a cut down of Venezuela oil export to Cuba and export services and oil products from Cuba to Venezuela. This supply shock has generated negative GDP growth with high inflation. It also implies lower uh, per capita income and real wages with balance of payment problems, as commented by uh, Hernandez Cata on Monday and Espadoni uh, yesterday. The impact of COVID-19 has also been significant. As mentioned by uh, Mesagal, Mesa Lago, the Cuba's economic situation represents the failure of the inefficient economic model of centralized planning, staying um, enterprise, and uh, agricultural collectivization. In addition, there have been too many restrictions, disincentives, and taxes, which impede the growth of the private sector. Domestic capital accumulation has been insufficient and obstacle, uh, obstacle for economic growth. In fact, the Cuban leadership aborted the market-oriented reform because they were concerned that they were weakening their political control. Or as uh, put uh, Hernandez Catar on Monday, fear of change. The way to deal with the depressed environment may bring conflicts between economic reality and ideological views. In my opinion, the central, plan the central planning ideas may have no way to deal with external such, um, with external shocks, such as a total cut off of oil import, commodity market volatility, international sanctions, among others in order to reduce the economic and social deterioration. The current Cuba's economic model, like the, the current Venezuelan economic, uh, the current Venezuela economic model seems to be now 
financially unsustainable. Price volatility will accelerate and social well-being will be deeply affected. Market reform seems inevitable, as commented by uh, Seigli. In my view, Cuba has two extreme political options. One, to implement only quantity adjustment without the price system via rationing, as it has done in the past. Or two, to implement a macro-friendly strategy, a price and quantity adjustment, and a private sector has to lead the economic process. The former will generate lower GDP, uh, lower uh, per capita income, and poor uh, social indicators. The latter may represent a better scheme in social and economic and social terms. It seems clear that a political process with non-democratic trajectory may not be able to generate an stimulus economic scenario which improves the social welfare. Regarding Pedraza Romero questions, are Venezuela, uh, are Cuba and Venezuela at a crossroad? The answer is obviously no. However, they are as mentioned by Grishin in a point of no return. And as Pedraza and Romero say, they are standing at the edge of this uh, precipitate. And that is true. Now, Venezuela and Cuban authority have to avoid to taking a step forward. They also ask, how is it possible for, for, for their government to continue to hold on to power in the face of those deep-seated crises? My answer is, there is no way that they will be able to hold on in a continuous deteriorating economic and social environment. Pedraza and Romero's second scenario, structural changes in the economy without changes in the political institution may seem appropriate. However, economic changes with the same institutional structure with major reputational problems may not generate the necessary credibility to stimulate investment, growth, and social welfare soon, soon enough. In this context, political instability and social deterioration may continue. Therefore, that scenario may not be long lasting. It implies that improved economic and social condition must require transitional uh, political periods. In the case of Venezuela, political transition at the end implied lifting U.S. sanctions, multilateral financing, mainly IMF financing, oil production recovery, and increasing fiscal proceeds. That means economic growth, lower inflation, and social improvement. In any case, it has to be, um, it has to be a difficult context, um, a difficult process in a context where, where institutional structure has been deeply affected, like in Venezuela, and the unlimited power of the Cuba's Communist Party. Therefore, international community has now a unique importance. Norway and the European Union started the process in Venezuela. The Lima Group is also involved, and the new U.S. administration will have to participate. It seems to me for the Venezuelan case that the multinational approach is the way to go, including international actors close to Maduro, such as Norway, Spain, and now uh, Turkey, Russia, and China. They should bring uh, new acceptable ideas instead of asking like other actors for surrender. There is a mid-80s Contadora Equipolas experience which brought positive proposal to solve the violent uh, Central American conflict. Remember Contadora was an initiative launched by uh, Colombia, Mexico, Panama, and Venezuela with the initial support of Sweden to deal with the military conflict in El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Guatemala, and at the same time, reduce the U.S. military views. The new U.S. administration will have to be uh, relevant in the dealing with the current political instability in Venezuela and in Cuba, and even Nicaragua. 
starting with the participation of the now president uh, Biden in the in the in the former Obama strategy toward Cuba. However, it may be an explore, uh, it may be a slow process, as uh, May Bardug and Herrero mentioned yesterday. In addition, the outcome of the yesterday uh, Georgia senatorial election is relevant. It defined the new structure of the Democratic lay U.S. Uh, Senate and the possible design of the new U.S. Uh, administration foreign policy in the context of the new political movement in the, in the region. Moreover, future events such as the Summit of the America, which will be held in the U.S. and the April 2021 uh, Cuba at, uh, Eighth uh, Communist Party Congress to also uh, should also uh, define the future political environment. To end my remarks, my feeling is that short-term political solutions are not anticipated, and economic and social deterioration will continue. I believe that the expected political transitions may be a long process with unknown path characteristics and timing. Venezuela and Cuba. In this context, required to uh, build in consensus, reestablish institutions and social inclusion in order to guarantee a long-term success, success in a democratic uh, framework. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having excellent comments, and you have provided additional food for thought here for our participants. We do have a, um, a couple of questions. Well, one was withdrawn, apparently, but um, someone wants to know um, what you perceive, mostly uh, Jose Manuel, what you perceive in terms of a Biden administration, in terms of Venezuela in particular, and uh, Sylvie, maybe you can address that in relation to Cuba. So what does the future bring? Jose Manuel? Unmute yourself, unmute, unmute. Thank you, thank you, Beatriz. I, I believe that question is better for Sylvia or Carlos that know much better than me the international relations and the relation between US and Venezuela and Cuba. I can complement that, but I believe that question is for them. Okay, Silvia, do you want to get started with that? Unmute your yourself. Sí, yo quiero agregar sobre eso que hay mucha esperanza sobre que Biden va a cambiar la política hacia Venezuela y Cuba. No lo creo así. Estamos en este momento, por cierto, viviendo una experiencia nunca imaginable en el Capitolio Federal de los Estados Unidos. Y eso, a mi modo de ver, es una expresión que Biden va a conseguir un país muy complicado que no le va a permitir tomar decisiones sobre eh, temas menores de carácter internacional. Eh, prefiere tener un status quo de lo que va a heredar como presidente de los Estados Unidos, dedicarse al tema, en primer lugar, el tema del COVID-19 y en segundo lugar, el tema de Trump y sus seguidores que lamentablemente este, están desarrollando un camino de violencia eh, difícil. De tal manera que no, se, no, no podemos esperar un cambio drástico en los primeros meses en relación a Cuba y Venezuela por parte del gobierno de Joe Biden. Yeah. Eh, yo estoy de acuerdo con lo que Carlos acaba de decir. Por lo general estamos de acuerdo. <risa> no es una novedad. Eh, yo lo que sí quería decir, porque me pareció interesante la, el, la pregunta que Luis, Luis había hecho con respecto a que los datos de la ONEI en Cuba, la oficina de estadística, decían que Venezuela le había mandado a Cuba 1.8 billones de productos de oil, de gasolina, en petróleo, perdón, en el 2019, o un averaje de 99 mil barriles de, eh, al día. Y entonces preguntaba a Luis, how can Venezuela afford this largesse? Yo estaba buscando rápidamente nuestros datos a ver si teníamos otros datos alternativos. Creo que tenemos que buscarlo 
porque honestamente a mí me parece que esa cifra es falsa. Yo esto no lo digo nunca, sí. y, y, menos, y menos de ONEI, porque ONEI verdaderamente yo he conocido a algunos de los muchachos jóvenes que trabajan ahí con las estadísticas y demás, y ellos han, han tratado de mantenerse lo más posible dentro de la línea de la verdad. ¿no? Y, y además que realmente es muy, da, es muy difícil siempre cambiar un dato, porque no es ese, es ese dato nada más, hay que cambiar los otros cuatro datos que van con ese dato, ¿no? así que sí, tampoco sí, pero... se presta. Pero, pero la realidad es que a mí me parece, dadas las conversaciones que yo he oído con personas en Cuba, que no son 99 mil barriles de petróleo al ya, día, desde hace ya. tiempo son alrededor de 30 mil barriles o cosas así. Sí, Silvio, claro. para complementar brevemente, coincido con, con ustedes. Eh, dada la caída de la producción petrolera venezolana, es casi imposible, la bueno. producción petrolera es de 350 mil barriles por día. Eh, es casi imposible que Venezuela pueda estar enviando 100.000 barriles al día a Cuba. Right. Es decir, el monto debe ser menor. Sin embargo, hay que tener muy en cuenta que para Venezuela Cuba es muy, pero muy importante. Sí. No por el número de entrenadores deportivos, no por el número de médicos que nos envían para las misiones, sino que es muy importante para los servicios de inteligencia venezolanos. Y muchas de las decisiones, y no estoy descubriendo la agua tibia, que se toman en política interna en Venezuela, se toman en La Habana. Por ejemplo, la decisión de que Nicolás Maduro fuera el sucesor de Hugo Chávez fue una decisión que se hizo en Cuba. Entonces, la simbiosis entre la Revolución Cubana y Venezolana es muy fuerte y Venezuela y Maduro van a hacer lo imposible por ayudar hasta el último, la última gota de petróleo que puedan a Cuba. Pero indudablemente el monto debe ser menor. Sin embargo, esa ayuda va a continuar porque Cuba gana mucho y Venezuela gana mu mucho en esa relación eh, dramática entre dos regulaciones que han llevado a sus países a grandes catástrofes económicas y sociales. Right. Silvia, la, el número de nosotros es alrededor de 40.000. Ajá, eso, eso está eh, con lo que yo he oído decir a la gente que uh -huh, uh -huh. en Cuba. Eh, y la fuente que, del, del gobierno esto, venezolano es 53. ¿Es cuánto? 53.000. 53 mil. Y sí, esos dos, me, esos dos me, me parece que yo creo que yo creo que si Onei está diciendo en estos momentos que son 99 mil barriles al día, que eso es para pintar la situación como menos crítica de lo que es. Porque, porque después de todo, Venezuela es solo, es, no es solo eh, importante políticamente, también lo es económicamente. Es el único socio mayor de Cuba en estos momentos. Así que yo, yo, por lo general, yo realmente creo que ONEI, los datos de ONEI son muy respetables, pero este no me parece que, que cuadra con la situación. Ok, en los últimos tres minutos que nos quedan, hay otra pregunta. Ustedes la, la están viendo. Una explicación de expertos es que hubo transshipment de Cuba a terceros países de parte de estos 99 mil barriles diarios. ¿Algún comentario? Bueno, ¿qué es lo que sí, quiere decir transshipment? Que yo le pregunto a Luis, a terceros países. A, a otros otro barcos. Reventa, otro reventa. Reexportación. Sí. 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 Eh, siempre yo, lo hubo, desde su... el año 2000 en adelante, siempre lo hubo. Se le daba una cuota sí. al gobierno de Cuba para que, eh, CEPET, para la compañía cubana, para que los revendiera. Este era un gran negocio que tuvieron... No sé si ahora habrá posibilidades, porque yo pero, creo que... Pero todavía tiene que haber una donación de 99 mil para, para que después se puedan vender a otro sitio. No, pero no, son, no es 99 mil en el momento total de exportación. De esos 99 mil, hubo una parte más o menos de un, ter, un tercio que era Ajá. reportado, que era el gran negocio que tenía CEPED con PDVSA. Ajá. Sí, no, no, eh, en el pasado yo hice este cálculo con alguien que ustedes conocen muy bien, Joaquín Villalobos, que conoce muy bien Cuba. Eh, en un principio, cuando la transferencia o el envío de petróleo venezolano era de 80 o 100 mil barriles, 80 o 100 mil barriles está muy por encima de la necesidad de consumo de combustible de la isla. ¿Qué quiere decir eso? Que la isla resolvía su problema energético gracias al petróleo venezolano y la diferencia lo vendía a los mercados internacionales y con eso recibía cash en dólares. Entonces Cuba hacía un gran negocio, resolvía su problema energético y recibía cash para sus problemas en el área de salud, de infraestructura, etcétera, etcétera. Entonces era eh, un negocio fantástico para los cubanos 
y los venezolanos también recibían eh, un, un, un gran favor a cambio, y entre ellos, como les decía, eh, más allá de los doctores, de los entrenadores deportivos, las labores de inteligencia eh, y las grandes decisiones de política interna venezolana que se siguen tomando en La Habana. No, y el partnership, Eso es cierto. ¿verdad? la asociación, eso es lo más importante, la asociación pragmática. Uh -huh. Eso es cierto. Así eso es. es cierto. Correcto. Bueno, tenemos, tenemos que escribir algo porque estamos de acuerdo en todo esto. Es una explicación <risa> interesante. <risa> bueno, Five O'Clock. Ah, dice Creo que, que PDVSA ha estado utilizando almacenamiento de petróleo en Cuba, si no es sorprendente. Eso claro, no es sorprendente. por supuesto. Sí. Eso puede estar Pero, ocurriendo porque la, la producción de petróleo de Venezuela ha caído tan rápido los últimos meses debido a que tiene problemas para poder vender y sigue produciendo y lo que está haciendo es eh, tratando de almacenar y de hecho todos uh, los lugares de almacenamiento están completos entonces eh, la producción ha tenido que caer más rápido bueno yo yo Beatriz yeah. Beatriz está mute ah estás muted Estás muted. Ajá. Ahora sí. Ahora bueno, sí. muchas gracias. It's been a real, real pleasure. Thanks a Silvia, Carlos, Efraín, and Jose Manuel for an excellent presentation. It was a pleasure for me to be your chair. And now we're going to transition to closing remarks of the entire conference. So, um, hey, we'll Gary. We're depending on Larry to bring us that. <laughs> and here yeah. I am. Welcome. Oh boy. <laughs> Gary's on. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, and thank you for an excellent closing panel. Um, just so much food for thought and so much more discussion. Uh, but it's my pleasure now to bring uh, these proceedings to an end by introducing us again to ASCII's president, Gary Maberduke, who will deliver the closing remarks. Gary, it's all yours. Okay, I just wanted to say, um, I did not participate in this last session, but I was very glad to have it. Um, when we planned um, our meeting for last August, um, we had planned to do a lot more on, the, on Cuba and Venezuela. We had at least two panels uh, planned. Um, but then uh, things broke in Cuba and pandemic broke here and we sort of canceled. And so now we're kind of beginning to make up for that. And I hope we will do more in Venezuela in, in the future. Um, I should say, and, and without making any comments about Venezuela and, and Cuba in general, that I had the um, great privilege or perhaps great tragedy of having shifted um, from my assignment in Cuba to my assignment as economic counselor in, um, in Caracas, just as Hugo Chavez came into power, where I stayed until um, 2002 and the uh, so-called double coup, um, uh, which is a term that really didn't fit what actually happened in either Cuban, in either Spanish or in, um, English, but it was clearly one of the most amazing events I've ever watched. So anyway, um, Larry's just put up where you can get video recordings of the conference. And Larry, um, don't keep that up too long because I do need to talk. But anyway, um, we had a good, I would like to start by thanking everyone, organizers, participants, and the audience. Um, for three days of, of, of an excellent virtual conference. I hope for this conference was to focus on constructive criticism of Cuba's efforts at reform mm -hmm. and to make comments. Larry, am I on? Yes, you are. Okay, because all I'm saying is other people. Um, but in any event, um, 
I hope for this conference was to focus on constructive criticism of Kubert's efforts on reform and perhaps make a few comments and suggestions for the Biden administration. I think we met that goal very, very well, and I'm very, very pleased. We had a good audience. I hope our rebroadcast will reach a great many more people in the weeks ahead. If you wish to send them to your contacts and friends, they can be accessed, as Larry just put up the screen a minute ago. Maybe you can put it up at the end of this, my comments too, Larry. Um, or through eventually the ASCII website or the ASCII page on YouTube. If, they wish, if you wish to send them to your, I'm sorry, I already said that. Okay. At this time, I'd like to give my personal thanks to the virtual committee and the planners for this conference. At the end of my thank you, please stay around for a few announcements of what lies ahead. So let me start off um, thanking Jorge Perez Lopez, um, who I think every conference chair for the last 30 years has, has thanked for his help in organizing the, um, the sessions and putting together the Cuban in Transition book. We have to thank, of course, Larry. Larry um, is, I think, probably intellectual inspiration for our two virtual conferences and certainly has taken charge of doing a lot of the work. And Larry, thank you very much. Um, Frank Carlos, who I don't think is here at the moment, but um, Frank um, has been our technical organizer and advisor, and most of us could not have achieved this without his help. I don't know if Joaquin Pajul is around. Um, if he is, I want to thank him. He wasn't so much part of our organizational committee this time. He was in the midst of a move. But Joaquin has been the, a heart, if not the heart of ASCII for many, many years. He's produced our news clippings, which members, and it was exclusive to members, um, use for their research and their help. He is now retired for that. I'm hoping we'll find somebody else to replace him. In any event, he is going to be severely missed. Uh, Lorenzo Perez, our secretary, um, my right-hand person, my confidant, great help, and I really want to thank Lorenzo for his help. Michael Strauss, who, when he got off the board, he's in Paris, I think was hoping that he wouldn't have to... Um, have meetings at two in the morning in Paris where the rest of us met at a reasonable hour. Um, but we, ha we hauled him into our planning and he was a big help there too. So thank you, Michael, if you're listening and not asleep. As Sylvia Nielsen, um, our treasurer, she's had a lot of hard work and she's still doing it and she will always do it. Our finances are always precarious and Sylvia is very important to us. Finally, of course, Sylvia Pedrasa, she organized, helped organize the first virtual conference. She just helped put on an excellent presentation now on this Columbia Venezuelan thing. And she's always a source of good advice. Finally, a special thanks must be given to the board. The whole ASCII board participated in this effort. Um, we had long discussions in ASCII meetings, board meetings. We had long discussion over the subject matter of this conference, a fight over the title. Um, and the board gave us consistently good advice and approved the final plans for the conference. So not everybody was involved in every aspect of the conference, but again, the board was very, very helpful. So now I just have a couple of announcements. Later this month, Natalia Delgado will organize a virtual meeting to discuss ways the Cuban government can make their own country more open to foreign investment. This is an important topic because as many of the panelists have mentioned in the, in the last three days, Cuba needs this investment and at least some of its officials claim to want it. So we're gonna be, uh, Natalia is working that with um, um, Stephen Kimmerling and I'm looking forward to that being a great, great session. Um, then in early February, we will have another webinar on Cuba's reforms and initial assessment of the devaluation. 
That panel will be led by Carlos Camelo Mesa Lago and Pavel Vidal, and most likely another macroeconomist from the island who we haven't invited yet. ASCII is very fortunate to have many excellent macroeconomists to choose from, from California to Boston to New York, Puerto Rico, Cuba, and Colombia. And this is a very great risk case for which, in Venezuela, um, for which we are very grateful. There are likely to be several more webinars in the next few months. If you'd like to suggest, organize, or participate in these events, please feel free to contact me directly. I should point out that in the last 20, that of the last 20, I should point out of the 20 odd panelists who have participated in the last three days, 10 or 10, almost half, are new to ASCII. We are always looking for new blood and fresh ideas. And so we hope that the people out there who haven't been part of ASCII before will gen, will gen up some ideas and get them to us. Then in next August, August 12th to 14th, we will have our next planned annual meeting, hopefully live in Miami at the Florida International University. Clearly our members want to meet old friends. We've missed the camaraderie of the meetings and, and of course develop new relationships with new members. And we hope many of you will consider joining. Should we not be able to meet in person, then we'll have another virtual meeting. Keep checking our website as when we call for papers. If you wish to explore possibilities ahead of time, you can always email me at ghmayberduke at, at gmail.com or Harpe Perez directly. You can also do it through the ASCII mailing um, email. So I wish you now all a happy new year and thank you all for your great work. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. <clears throat> thank you, folks. And we can, I'll do this European style, we can declare the conference closed. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.